Thank you, Dr. Molnar. I want to thank uh, the invitation by Dr. Wang and Dr. Molnar. As I was driving to Ottawa, I felt like being home. I could see that the license in the cars are in blue uh, characters, uh, similar to Quebec. There was a lot of traffic, road construction. And as I came here, I realized it was bilingual. Like Very good. Um, I have no disclosure to make, and I have proposed some learning objectives, and I hope that the content of the lecture will uh, answer these uh, learning objectives. To start with, I would like to draw your attention to uh, changes in weight that takes place as one ages uh, in general. We put, in average, about 12 kilos of weight. Uh, as we move from the 20s to the 60s, then after there is some weight loss. All of that weight is not necessarily uh, building muscle. In fact, is gaining weight to increase fat. I'm presenting here in a, uh, a pie chart the distribution of the different body compartments and comparing a young with an elderly woman of the same uh, weight uh, and uh, BMI. And you, as you can see, uh, uh, the, uh, the percentage of fat goes from 27 to 43. And if they have maintained the same weight, it's because another compartment is decreasing. And this compartment is mainly muscle mass, which goes from about 30% in a young woman down to 20% 20, uh, 20 in an elderly woman. The other compartments remain pretty much the same. So there is implications of all of these changes in terms of uh, functional capacity and performance. And in men, it's quite similar, except that we have different uh, body compartments proportions, but the decrease in muscle uh, mass is about 50%, similar to women, uh, uh, and the gain in fat is about 84%, uh, relatively uh, in percentage. And this is typical of North American uh, population. Now, the, the fat in particular tends to be more centralized. Uh, at the level of uh, uh, the muscle, at the thigh level, I have a cut of uh, uh, MRI of the thigh comparing a, a young woman versus an elderly woman. As one can see, not only the volume of the muscle has shrink, but also the muscle itself is infiltrated with fat, as presented here in this uh, violet color. At the level of the abdomen, the the deposition of fat, which is very central, what we call visceral fat, is quite obvious comparing the waist of a young person and elderly woman. And again, uh, and the fat here is, is in this turquoise color, okay? The rest is, is the visceral organs. And another, another interesting uh, phenomenon is that the uh, paravertebral muscles are also not only shrinked in volume, this is the red zone here that you compare to in the elderly person, but also, again, uh, all infiltrated with fat. And this might contribute to decrease central control uh, of the movements if this uh, decreasing mass is associ associated with weaknesses that we will see. Now, there is a, a crosstalk between fat and muscle. So if the aging uh, contributes to increase fat and to decrease muscle, we know that all of this is also mediated through exercise and diet. So that lifestyle uh, uh, factors are strong uh, uh, factors influencing all of this body composition changes. Uh, not to account in, in other hormonal and, and inflammatory mediators that we'll talk next. But uh, once your uh, muscle uh, uh, compartment have gone down, there is an impact on uh, basal metabolic rate. This is the amount of energy one spends. And if you continue to eat the same, you don't have to increase your food intake but your metabolism has gone down, down because you have lost some muscle, which is a, a physiological active tissue, well, all the energy that you're going to be eating in surplus than what it is burned will be accumulated as fat because the body conserves all energy possible. We are made this way. And uh, 
also the fat tissue is an active tissue. We thought that would be only would, would serve only for reserves of energy as fat, but in fact not. It produces a lot of uh, uh, mediators that we call cytokines, and these cytokines, some of some of them, not all, are pro-inflammatory and contribute to decrease muscle further. So gaining too much fat uh, is bad for muscle. And if you lose muscle, you also contribute to increase fat. So there's a, 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 a common uh, contribution of each other to explain what is going on with age in terms of changes in body composition. How this reflects in function, this is what we're going to be seeing now. First, the term sarcopenia was proposed in 1988 by uh, Dr. Rosenberg, and he was st struck by the fact that there is these enormous changes in body composition, and he felt, he was the first to uh, attract attention to this phenomenon, that this uh, age-related re decline in muscle in particular, because sarcopenia stands for sarcos with has to do with red flesh, and penia is a Greek term signifying lack of. It is why when we talk about osteopenia is the lack of bone, in sarcopenia is the lack of flesh, muscle, and he pointed out that there is not so many striking changes as the, the decrease in muscle. And this, he thought, would be the cause of uh, decreased ambulation, mobility, uh, changes in energy intake, etc., etc., which I pointed, I pointed to you some of it before. Now, what are the causes of sarcopenia? There are many, detail, many uh, studies in literature and the contribution leading to sarcopenia varies from one factor to the other, but all have been implicated. And probably as one ages, they're all part of the, the, the picture. And certainly, uh, I would say that inactivity is becoming uh, the most important contributor for the decrease in muscle mass. As one ages, we become very sedentary. There is some nutrition factors. The nutrition factors uh, are there as um, uh, in the background because we eat relatively well in North America, still there is a sarcopenia. Obviously, if one is eating poorly, which happens during periods of illness, hospitalizations, etc., trauma, this is when it contributes to the decrease in, in, in muscle mass leading to sarcopenia. But as one ages, there is a phenomenon taking place at the level of our central nervous system mainly the loss of motor neurons from the spine. And we're going to show some of these evidences. And with age, there is an adverse uh, hormonal uh, uh, milieu in which there is decreases in the anabolic drive. This is a decrease in uh, insulin growth factor one, uh, decrease uh, sex hormone, testosterone, and estrogens. And at the same time, there is a, a pro-inflammatory state with higher levels of uh, interleukin-6, anti-NF-alpha, and others, including some other in inflammatory mediators. All of this contributes to decrease uh, protein synthesis, to increase protein breakdown, and over time, it leads to a low muscle mass that we call sarcopenia. At least this is what was proposed in 1988, sarcopenia being defined only in the basis of low muscle mass when it attains a certain level. Once there is sarcopenia, uh, we think that it leads to weaknesses, though there is evidence now that this relationship is not a straightforward relationship with a, a correlation of one, but less than that. And there is also decreased metabolic reserves. And, and this would then lead to eventually disability, uh, morbidity with falls and hospitalizations as well as increased mortality. And there is uh, several studies confirming that sarcopenia, yes, contributes to disability, uh, morbidity, etc. I have uh, an interest in insulin, but I will not tackle this issue at this presentation. But the result is over time, the muscle volume bulk goes down, as one can see. And cross-sectional studies looking at NAIDS uh, data uh, analyzed by Jensen is, is at uh, 
Ian Jensen, who is at, at Kingston, uh, clearly show that there is a decrease in muscle, though as one can see a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of variation, but the trend is there, the general trend. And the percentage of muscle mass is the m amount of muscle overweight shows a, a, a straight decline, both in men as well as in women. Now, how much of this muscle loss contributes to decreasing in strength and function, we will see. To start with, yes, there is a relationship between muscle mass, uh, as measured here in terms of cross-section area, and, and strength. This is uh, one repetition, uh, maximum leg press. But this, this relationship is not, uh, is not one. It, it's a moderate relationship. So some people who have low muscle volumes may be very strong. And this refers to another phenomenon uh, that we call muscle quality that is also important to take into consideration as one ages. But the fact is muscle mass and strength are important to maintain function. This is a model proposed by the WHO in which uh, as one uh, uh, advances in age and muscle mass is decreasing and strength is decreasing, we might over time reach a threshold below which uh, we cannot be performant and the consequences is progressing to a, into disability. Uh, obviously, the disability can be compensated by environmental factors, but it it's, would be bad if one can maintain a, 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 a high level of muscle mass and strength. So from the physiological point of view, uh, there is decrease in muscle, and muscles are composed of fibers. There is mainly two types of fibers. We call it fiber one uh, type and fiber two type. There is A and X. Uh, mainly uh, what we should know is that fiber type one is the fiber related to endurance, where fiber two is that responsible for uh, producing strength. And as one compares a, a, a younger a piece of tissue, muscle tissue from a younger person versus a, another one older, one can see that we lose a lot of this fiber two uh, type uh, related to strength. What uh, prevails is fiber one, uh, and there is also a grouping of fiber one, and we don't know exactly what this means, but it is an uh, architectural change at the muscle level. The rate of the decrease, uh, it's, it's uh, from 20 to 50 is a, a slow decrease. From 50 and over then is a more steep decrease. And from 50 over we lose about 1% per year. So that by decade is about 10% after age 50. Um, but this decrease is not necessarily so straight and all related to, to physiology. There is also life events. And this is when we tend to lose more following a hip replacement surgery, following a bout of pneumonia, uh, fall, etc. So the progressive uh, decline is here with life events. And the difficulty is we usually, as one ages, have difficulty bringing back uh, the level of muscle and strength one at before these events. Part of it is, is due to uh, the difficulty our own uh, muscle cells have the capacity to renew themselves so it has to do with uh, uh, satellite cells uh, development and there's a lot of research focusing on that. So more um, important than the loss of muscle is the loss of strength. If the muscle is, is present is to produce strength and the decrease in strength is twice as much as that of muscle loss. In fact, the, the, uh, the loss is about 2 to 3 percent per year of age, after age 50, whereas muscle volume is about 1 percent. And all kinds of strength measurements, be it isokinetic, uh, uh, um, concentric, or, and also the opposition between agonists and antagonists, muscles that enables one to maintain posture. And this is uh, data from, from uh, uh, produced by Luigi Ferrucci showing that over time, cross-sectionally, that the amount of muscle loss 
uh, which is in about 20% or so when you reach 85 of uh, age group. Uh, and, and, but the amount of loss of strength is 40%. It's double that. Okay. <coughs> now, there's also another concept other than strength, is muscle power. And muscle power is the development of strength over time to produce rapid and strong movements. And this decrease is even more compromised than strength alone. Uh, alone. Power goes down by about 3% 3, 3 per year after age 50. And there, then there is tremendous impact. And one, this is one of the reasons why when an older person falls, she, she or he tends to hit the ground and break their hips. Whereas a younger person, when, when she or he loses uh, balance, they usually hit the ground with their hands and they break their, their wrists. Reason for that is the younger person is able to do more faster movement and prevent some of the impact with the floor with the hands, whereas the older person never has that time to react, to uh, absorb the shock, the shock. Again, just very briefly, uh, together with the decrease in strength and the muscle, the concept of uh, muscle quality is also raised. And this is uh, assessed by uh, dividing the, uh, 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 the force, uh, kilos of strength, by the volume of the muscle in an area and determine is this a, a, a better quality of muscle than another, an, another person who could have uh, lower numbers. And th there is a strong relationship between muscle quality and the amount of fat infiltrating uh, the muscle. It's, it's, it seems as if the fat infiltrating the muscle will contribute to reduce the, 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 the force production. Maybe it has to do with uh, mobilization of, of energy at the mitochondrial level to produce the necessary energy to produce contraction and force. But this, these are things that are well described. But obviously, when one talks about uh, mobility, about function, about capacity to perform ADLs and IADLs, it is more than simple force, simple strength. You know, it involves all of these movements we do in daily. Uh, incorporates coordination, uh, antagonizing muscles, uh, uh, there is balance, there is also higher brain function, the rapidity with which we analyze what we are doing, and all of this contributes to our performance. One of the ways of explaining this discrepancy between decreasing muscle and a much greater decrease in strength with age has to do with motor uh, units. A motor unit is the number of fibers innervated by uh, alpha motor neuron from the spine. And as one uh, uh, ages, the number of motor neurons decreases, but also per motor neuron, there is less of fibers being innervated, and there is also less of collateral uh, fibers being innervated, such that the motor unit that is the combination of the motor uh, alpha neuron and the number of fibers, as presented here, uh, is, is a strike decrease as one ages. And, and this is then a strong component of our neurological system contributing, contributing to, to the weaknesses. Now, practical uh, issues about sarcopenia. How can I identify a sarcopenic person? It's not so obvious if you don't have certain instruments to help you with this assessment. Because we would, you would need to have either a DEXA scan or a, or a, a BIE, a bio, bioelectric impedance analyzer. Using, using um, DEXA scan, assessing the amount of muscle in the uh, um, arms and, and legs, uh, we came uh, with an index, uh, what we call muscle mass index, uh, when this value of muscles of the limbs are divided by the height of the person, just to correct for the size, because these persons who are taller than others, 
a little bit like the BMI where you divide the weight by the height squared, the same applies here. And then it was proposed that if a person has a muscle mass index uh, less than two standard deviations of a reference younger population, this will make the person sarcopenic. And this index is, is, is about uh, 5.7 uh, in women and about 8.5 in men. And th this, um, this definition is similar to the definition one uses to uh, uh, classify osteoporosis. If the bone density is less than two standard deviations below the average reference, a person is called uh, osteoporotic. In fact, if it is less than one standard deviation, the person is called osteopenic. And same applies here in this concept. And the prevalence of sarcopenia using this uh, definition is about, in different studies, is about 10 to 25 percent uh, in a group of uh, uh, at any persons of uh, uh, 60 to 75 years of age. In the population above 85, the percentage of uh, sarcopenia then increases to reach numbers as 30 to 40 percent easily. And, and the, the studies have, have clearly shown that sarcopenia has been associated with difficulties in performing IEDLs and having problems with balance and the use of cane which is a marker of reduced uh, mobility. You can also use BIA. BIA is a device that uh, is more simpler, uh, can, can be done in an office. It's a, an instrument that, that uh, costs about, uh, can have for less than $1,000. It measures uh, the amount of fluid in the body, and there is a strong relationship between fluid and, and uh, lean tissue, because in the fat there is no, no water. Um, so we can calculate muscle mass, calculate an index. The index proposed using BIA is, is to do a uh, total amount of muscle uh, uh, over body mass, which is weight, and defined as a percentage. And again, we can classify as, as a, a class one, meaning that it's less than one standard deviation, class two, uh, more than, than one standard deviation, class two, more than two standard deviations below a reference younger population. And using that definition, sarcopenia have been associated with two to four times greater decline in function and disability. Uh, so this is what is usually used as ways of determining is an older person sarcopenic or not. Now, however, in terms of function, Excess weight, obesity, has also been associated with decreased performance, mobility in particular. Um, and, and, and the studies in general, uh, the, for example, Hélène Vincent has reviewed the literature and produced a, a kind of meta-analysis. And clearly, the problem with mobility starts to appear when, when the BMI is above 30. Between 30 and 35, depending on, on person's strength, obesity, obesity tends to have an impact on, on mobility. And this is important to take into consideration uh, when, one, when one is doing uh, uh, measurements of performance in an older person, uh, so that I think that the worst case scenario would be to have a sarcopenic obese person. So trying to define uh, uh, what are the conditions for a, a sarcopenic uh, obese uh, definition? Uh, we came about uh, with having a, a certain uh, uh, value of body fat, but to have percentage of body fat being calculated, you really need a DEXA. Or else you can use the BMI as a, a definition for obesity, knowing that if your BMI is over 30, that makes you obese. You still have to define the sarcopenic sarcopenic part, either by BIA or by DEXA. And what's happened if you have both combined? What has been shown is that being a sarcopenic obese person has been associated with two to three times higher IDL disability and with a, a prognostic value over the, 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 the next seven years. So is it longitudinal? You can make prognosis with it. And whereas in that particular study by Baumgartner was the first to define sar sarcopenic obesity, uh, obesity alone or sarcopenic alone were not associated with IDL disability. Okay? So uh, this brings another level of difficulty if the person together with her obesity also has sarcopenia. But 
Now, so far we have discussed muscle mass, strength, a little bit muscle quality, uh, and, and also obesity. So if we have all of these variables, which of them are really important to, uh, to predict disability or mobility difficulties? Where in, in this study uh, by Daniel Bouchard looking at all of these variables using n data, what she showed in a complex uh, uh, biostatistical model is that if you take into consideration these variables, uh, muscle mass, uh, strength, fat mass, and muscle quality, what is retained in the model is only fat mass and leg strength. Quality and muscle mass itself uh, is not retained. And, and the weight of the effect of the fat and, and, and strength on measures of function, gait speed, balance, uh, and questions on capacity such as walking for a quarter of a mile, uh, uh, climbing stairs, uh, being able to, to kneel and stand, and lifting weight, um, is that strength as a bigger load than fat in predicting uh, a functional uh, capacity. Okay. So both are important. The two major factors are strength and fat mass, but strength is even more important than fat. And this brought the concept of dynapenic obesity. The term dynapenic, dyna stands for uh, development of strength. So you're no longer talking about sarcopenia, which is just a, a decrease in muscle, but also the development of strength. So the worst case scenario is no longer sarcopenic obesity, but dynapenic obesity. Okay? And the fact is, uh, using uh, data from N. Ains, uh, trying to associate strength, uh, fat, and performance, what we know is, is after adjusting for the usual factors such as age and height, uh, is that, um, I'm trying to find my cursor here, okay, uh, is that dynapenic obesity, uh, persons suffering from not suffering, but having dynapenic obesity would have a slower gait speed than being obese uh, or than being uh, compared with normal. But they were not worse in terms of gait speed than those who were, were dynapenic, which tells in, telling us that the most important factor to predict performance uh, mobility is in fact strength. Now, because of this understanding that sarcopenic alone, sarcopenia alone doesn't mean uh, all the, doesn't mean much, in fact, to predict disability, to predict the physical performance, uh, a, a working group, the European Working Group on, on um, sarcopenia in older people, have proposed that sarcopenia should incorporate in its definition not only muscle volume but also some measures of performance, either based on strength or based on, on mobility using, strength is to measure with the end grip uh, and, and uh, function mobility either with gait speed or the short uh, physical performance battery test that has a combination of gait speed, uh, time up and go, uh, balance and, uh, and also chair standing. So this so to classify someone as sarcopenic nowadays, you have to, both, to have both a combination of low muscle mass and an impact in performance. This obviously is not so accessible to clinicians. And, and, uh, but it's important to mention it is that um, if you see someone and you, at the clinic and you measure the gait speed and the gait speed is below a certain threshold, you should be thinking that that person might be uh, sarcopenic. And, and in fact, there is a lot of commonalities between the new definition of sarcopenia and the definition of frailty proposed by the uh, frailty phenotype uh, presented by Linda uh, Fritz and its, its group. Frailty, this definition is not the only one available. There's many ways of looking at frailty, but based on, on this criteria that became very popular, certainly in the, 
in the research milieu, uh, in, in kinesiologists, for example, doing a lot of uh, uh, research on, on function and, and, uh, and uh, sarcopenia, etc., they use this model a lot because it's, they have uh, components there that they can measure where other, uh, uh, other tools for assessing frailty might not have. And as you can see, in this model, you have to have three of the five below to be called frail, and if you have one or two, then you are pre-frail. And using that, one of the criteria is uh, loss of body mass. This is loss of weight or weight loss, or if you, if, if you wish, unintentional weight loss. And any value more than 10 pounds over the past year is considered to be significant. But you, you can guess that if someone is losing weight, especially in an older age population, there is also sarcopenia uh, that is part of that weight loss. So one can say that the new definition of sarcopenia uh, includes one, at least one criteria of the frailty. Uh, there is also now weaknesses being part of this definition. So again, they share the same. And slowness as measured by gait speed, for example. And the cutoff here has been less than 0.8 meters per second. This cutoff has been associated with a lot of prediction. Eh? If someone has a, a gait speed below 0.8, he will have difficulty, uh, in fact, uh, uh, crossing the street outside the house. So going outdoors becomes problematic if you have a gait speed below 0.8. Our normal gate speed is around uh, uh, 1.1, 1.2 meters per second. Uh, and uh, our frail population, the ones we admit to our wards, have an average gate speed of 0.6 meters per second. So these are very frail people who, who uh, have difficulty functioning outside of their homes. And uh, in, in the sarcopenia, we don't uh, take into consideration fatigue nor low physical activity, which part of the components of the frailty uh, a criteria. So the relationship between frailty and, and uh, sarcopenia, as proposed by the, the frailty um, definition, uh, there is some chronic uh, malnutrition, is weight loss due to many factors. Uh, uh, but certainly, if you have weight loss, there will be some decrease in, 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 in uh, lean tissue, not only fat, but above all in older population lean. So this will lead to uh, sarcopenia. And the problem is compounded by the, by the changes in our hormonal uh, uh, anabolic drive as well as presence of inflammation. And the result is the changes in body composition with central adiposity, sarcopenia, <coughs> osteopenia. Once someone is sarcopenic, then uh, there is a decrease uh, in the exercise capacity as measured by a VTO, VO2 max, which is a measure of our amount of oxygen one consumes. And, and this value uh, is a mark of our degree of fitness. You know? Lance Armstrong have a VO2 max in the order of 70. Uh, milliliters per kilo per minute, whereas our frail population is, is uh, between 15 and 20, uh, so it's four times less. And you, when you reach that level, these levels of about 15, you don't produce enough energy that will enable you to sustain your weight and walk. You're too uh, fatigued. It takes a lot of energy out of you to perform basic tasks that we do without thinking about it. So if you have sarcopenia and your degree of fitness is so low, then you have less strength production and capacity. It will affect your gait. You will be less inclined to do physical activity. And as a, a result, you expand less activity. And there is a vicious circle that uh, maintains the state of frailty. It would be nice to overcome that. And there is trials making efforts for improving that. So this is just a review of uh, what is happening with sarcopenia. Less muscle contributes to a, a sensation of uh, uh, increased effort. And, and then we are less inclined to, uh, to be active and will contribute further to muscle atrophy. And the result is a, a vicious circle. Now, I have uh, participated in a longitudinal study in Quebec <coughs> where we, we, uh, we uh, uh, obtained a random sample of uh, older population 
by a, a five-year uh, uh, age strata going from 68 to 85, and we followed them for five years. They all underwent a physical examination, trying to select those who would, uh, uh, that we, we could call reasonable health status. And uh, after going through the examination and meeting criteria, there was about 1,800 individuals, uh, same number of men and women uh, uh, above 68. They were, at the outset, they were able to, uh, to walk outdoors for at least 300 meters, uh, capable of taking stairs, and were independent for ADLs. They underwent extensive evaluation. It was part of the, the NUASH study. NUASH stands for a nutrition and age study. And, but in French, NUASH stands for clouds. Uh, nothing to do with eye cloud, OK? <laughs> Fine. So we had body composition being measured. Uh, Performance using target speed, muscle strength, uh, very extensive evaluation. These were very kind senior people who participated in, in our study. They had this annually for four consecutive years. We wanted to do a fifth year, but there was no more budget to do that. And, and uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be included in, in the results I'm going to present to you, uh, we eliminated people with diabetes simply because diabetes have a greater impact in muscle and performance than, than usual age. And uh, the results I'm going to present to you is uh, in about 1,000 individuals. We estimate their muscle mass index. We try to classify them into five, uh, sorry, four categories of people. This is uh, uh, sar sarcopenic obese, sarcopenic people, obese people only, and normal. And uh, we correct, uh, uh, we made comparisons correcting for factors such as sex, uh, smoking, age, uh, number of physical chronic diseases, and, and also their uh, physical activity using the PACE questionnaire. We had all of this uh, available. And here I'm presenting the results uh, on this uh, group of uh, Quebec elderly people. Uh, the sarcopenic obese uh, corresponded to 16%, sarcopenic alone 24%, obese about 24%, whereas normal corresponded to 36% of the population. People who were sarcopenic, in average, they were slightly older, uh, as can be seen in year 75 versus 73 for the normal population. By criteria, they had less muscle. Men and women mixed together, about uh, 7.6 of uh, <coughs> muscle mass index, whereas uh, obese, non-sarcopenic, and, and, uh, and normals, they, they were about nine as an index. By criteria also, obese people had uh, uh, percentage of fat was higher, 40% versus 30. The four groups were different for BMI, corresponding to their uh, body composition with higher BMI if they were obese. Now, in terms of talk, uh, time up and go was, was uh, greater in those with obesity compared with those that are normal. And, and also obese people had slower gait speed compared with uh, uh, the sarcopenic or the normal ones. This gait speed, as you can see, is about 1.1. It's very close to normal population because this is a healthy elderly population. In fact, other studies that we did applying the, the uh, frailty criteria have shown that the, per the percentage of in that population, 68 to 82 of frailty is about 6%, so in general uh, healthy population. But even among them, being obese contributed to decreased mobility. In terms of uh, end grip strength, there was no difference between the groups, but all the sarcopenic groups were weaker compared to the obese non-sarcopenic and, and, uh, and normals. And the other aspect of interest is that uh, sarcopenic people, as well as normal, were able to stand in one leg, leg longer than those who were, who were uh, 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 obese. And this is a, a, an important aspect of these results. So sarcopenia, despite contributing to lower strength in several muscle groups, had no impact on function if function is uh, measured by the time up and go and gait speed. However, obesity, on the other hand, affected function. And this aspect seemed to be mediated by a worse balance, because their one leg stand was much, much uh, decreased. So we need to do further long longitudinal studies, because these were just cross-sectional uh, assessments, uh, to really define how these two components, sarcopenia 
and obesity affects performance over time. We're going to reach now the last uh, part of the presentation. This is a picture of uh, Mrs. Olga Kotelko, 93 years of age. Um, she, she holds about 10 world records in track and field. Um, she, she, uh, she is able to, uh, to do a height, height jump, I don't know what you call that, um, uh, to, to jump in, in, in uh, longitudinally. And her weight drawing is just amazing. I, I did a, a muscle biopsy on her uh, to study her, her mitochondrial function and the, the muscle tissue, the redness and, and the, the absence of fat was quite striking. As you know, the level of sedentarity in our uh, senior population is, is, is very high. There is 35% of the people do absolutely, absolutely nothing. Okay? And only 10% doing uh, resistive type exercise and other 5%, uh, sorry, 10% more vigorous exercise, only 5% who does muscle strength, uh, strengthening. And, and we know uh, th this is based on, on the consensus from the American, um, uh, American College of Sport Medicine and uh, American Heart Association that they published uh, uh, together in the circulation 2007, a review of the benefit of exercise, and exercise is the best anti-aging strategy. In general, any type of physical activity is better than nothing. Huh? Yes, because some people say, well, maybe uh, you have to go to a certain level of intensity. No, any exercise produces benefit. But obviously, if you are engaged in an in a exercise program, benefit will be even greater. And the effects of, of uh, exercise goes beyond just the physical benefit, because there's now evidence is that aerobic exercise can cont contribute to, uh, to prevent the progression of uh, uh, mild cognitive impairment, so to, to progress to, to dementia. And there is no drug that has been shown to prevent MCI to progress into dementia, and there is about 10% of conversion per year from MCI state to dementia, and exercise can have a role. And plus, exercise, uh, especially aerobic exercise, prevents weight gain and prevents insulin resistance and development of diabetes. So there is no doubt that exercise is beneficial. And in a study I'm involved, uh, uh, together with colleagues from, uh, from uh, McGill, we did compare older average uh, performance persons compared with master athletes. One of them, uh, part of the female group, uh, is, is Olga Kotelko that we just showed to you. But in general, they are, they are about 80, eh? 78, 79. And if you look at their, their weights, the athletes are much lower weights than, than, uh, than the non-athlete people. They have much less fat, okay? And in terms of performance, uh, the dorsiflexion of the foot, uh, their maximum voluntary contraction is 39% greater in men and 26% greater in women compared with, with their non-fit uh, 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 group. And when we do studies about uh, their action potential, the capacity to uh, uh, develop uh, uh, contraction uh, that can be measured by, during EMG, I mean, they, they, they develop greater action potentials. And uh, we did not see the increased potentials of the motor unit, but the estimation of the number of motor units is greater in athletes. So exercise is capable of maintaining the motor unit, which is essential to develop strength. Okay? On top of maintaining muscle, they can also maintain their uh, motor unit function so that they can develop further strength. And you might say these are super athletes. Only uh, less than 1% than can, can uh, age at that level. The fact is, even in frail people, exercise has been shown to be very beneficial. In this particular study, which is a randomized controlled trial, uh, with a baseline uh, VO2 max of 15. This is really low, this is frail people. And the index of uh, physical performance score of 28, the, these numbers are, uh, have moved, uh, over 36, so it's, it's a very low score. Uh, 
having them under, undergo a nine-month program of progressive uh, uh, global exercises, this combination of flexibility exercises, uh, resistant type, what we do see that after nine months, in fact, from three months on, we do, so, we do observe a, a greater performance in the trained group versus the ones who were just uh, receiving exercise at home. And uh, it's quite demanding, though, because they had to undergo three sessions per week in a, in a, in a, in a gym. But uh, it's, it's feasible. And in general, strength training is uh, associated with great gains in muscle, different muscle groups. And uh, meta-analysis have shown that strength training still has a slight impact in gait speed with uh, a weighted mean difference of 0.07 meters per second. So this is pure, pure uh, resistive uh, training. My last part is to talk about nutrition, okay? Because together with exercise, when, if we can improve nutrition, we might, in frail people, not talking about average uh, uh, successful older person, but the ones who are frail, ones we see in our clinical uh, wards in the hospital, um, nutrition becomes very important. In this, in this study uh, uh, from the Health ABC uh, court, followed for two years, uh, and having their muscle mass uh, or lean tissue measured by DEXA, what we do observe is that people in the fifth quintile of protein intake, this is people who are eating more than 1.1 gram of protein per day, recommendations for older people is 0.8, but the ones who are eating more than 1.1 gram, compared with those in the first quintile, which is less than 0.7 grams per kilo of body weight per day. Well, they have, you know, the difference in, in lean tissue loss over three years is half of that. So, uh, and they did correct for other variables. So, by giving more protein to older people, we may prevent decrease in muscle, uh, decrease in muscle mass. Now, the problem in older people is there, there is what one called a, a anabolic resistance. And, and what the study is showing that when a, a, a young group versus an older group of uh, subjects receive seven grams of essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are those we cannot synthesize and we must procure them from food. And they represent about 50% of total protein. So uh, giving them 15 grams of protein, what we do uh, observe is that older persons, they are not able to benefit from that protein as much as younger people because their rate of synthesis is about half of that of, uh, of uh, younger people. Now, I have done studies uh, using similar methodology uh, and measuring the uh, muscle synthesis rate uh, in biopsies taken from the vessel lateralis and offering them 22 grams of protein to older people. And in older people uh, at fasting state, post-absorptive in white, uh, and in response to the 23 grams of protein, they respond similarly. And nowadays we know that, that I showed to you that seven grams of essential amino acids are not enough, but another studies have shown that 15 grams then makes the difference between young and old to disappear. These results suggest that we have to offer more protein to older people in terms of uh, obtaining uh, results in, in, uh, in maintaining muscle mass and, and function. And in fact, a meta-analysis have, have clearly shown that adding protein to exercise is beneficial. It's like having the best of the two worlds, putting older people to exercise, and I've shown you that even frail ones can benefit. Uh, because adding protein to an exercise program have given uh, an increase in 13 kilos of, of gain in, in, in strength in the leg press. Uh, and my last two slides is just to show you that adding extra, uh, extra protein has increased as PPB, which is the short uh, physical battery test, and have also helped in, uh, in increased lean body mass. I, I'm going to stop here because of lack of time and uh, be available for answering your questions. Thank you.